So what is sober-minded and how do we get there? And what's the opposite of it? Let's go ahead and ask those questions real quick. What's up, folks? My name is Caldwin, and we want to talk about sobering up, the sober-minded Christian. But what is sober-minded? What is the opposite of it? How do you how do you ascertain in this world? And how do you how do you know anything for certain in this world where everything is practically like you know movie-led and it comes from weird concepts of entertainment and all that stuff? I just want to I just want these videos, as I've been blessed by the study of what the Bible talks about sober-mindedness, to be a blessing to you. And so ultimately what we've got to do is we just got to go through it. we got to go through it, what it says and to apply it into our mind and then apply it into our lives. And while we're walking around at three o'clock in the afternoon, when we're walking around New York City, when we're walking around, you know, shopping in Walmart, we have to apply everything we just heard to that. That's what real biblical Christianity and sober mindedness is about. Because you're not simply just putting away the drinks and blunts and whatever when you're getting sober. There's a lot more things that cause you not to be sober than you think. And so I really... Let's get into it. We've got we've got the, the the research and the information and all that stuff. But you know, the Bible teaches us that to speak thou. This is Titus being told this by his by his leader by his apostle, as he's an, as he's a New Testament pastor. He's told to speak thou. That means Titus. You're supposed to speak things which become sound doctrine, which means teachings. We'll talk about that. But what is the opposite of sobriety? The first question. The opposite of sobriety. There's many antonyms for sobriety. There is drunkenness, you know, alcoholic consumption causes drunkenness. There are highs, which is from weed and other other things that we'll, we'll talk about. The substances cause highs. There's trips, there's delusions, there's deceptions, aka, you know, religious deceptions, and then, you know, just straight up movie deceptions, all those things. These things all distort your reality. Uh, being underneath the influence or influences, like emotions, like when I am so angry that I can't even process the fact that my actions are going to be consequential, I am not sober emotionalism like or being guided by your emotions making long-term decisions you know based on emotions i really like this guy he's so handsome i'm gonna marry him oh oops i just married an abusive person those are not sober-minded decisions those are emotion-based decisions emotionalism also includes the way that the, we talked about before churches have, have turned music into the god whereby they can manipulate people because not only are you experiencing something with his music and being told this, that it's the Holy Spirit of God or the presence of God, but psychologically and scientifically speaking, as you repetitiously sing these songs and pray these prayers and do whatever, it's not just the gospel music in Christian churches, but as you're repetitiously just pouring music into your ear for hours on end or just vibration heavy music, you are actually destroying and altering the chemical process that your brain is supposed to make when you hear music. The dopamine levels are knocked out of whack. They can't do what they're naturally supposed to do as you more do music. Uh, and so therefore, then, when you consume too much music, the ability to correlate cause and effect, stimulus, response, action, and consequence is, is busted. That's, that's what that excess music does to us, which is not a sober-minded way to think. Music might be one of the most dangerous things on this list. So vain imaginations. I walk out of my dorm right here and instead of living in reality i walk out of the dorm thinking that i'm a celebrity a superstar whatever i'm living in a different universe essentially everything is centered around me oftentimes in our vain imaginations in our in our imaginary worlds those worlds center around us and really this world does not center around individuals it centers around the lord god jesus christ and it's intentionally meant to give him glory but we in the world end up giving other things and other deities glory which we'll t we've, we've talked about that extensively on this page. Go watch The Road to Strong Delusion to understand where this video came from in the first place. But right now we also were to talk about psychedelic music and experiences. You know, this was actually something that was more outward and popular way back in the day, but now psychedelic music and experiences are used as the means by which they can channel spirit energy, experience spiritual things, you know, we did an entire video called Music Delusion, where people will use different labels for the same exact music to cause different spiritual effects, which are essentially the same thing. It's witchcraft. <laughs> and so the hypnosis type of music is very easily tied to the witchcraft music because it was made to intentionally cause a spiritual effect or change outcomes and atmospheres and have power to affect things. That's witchcraft. That's transcendental music oftentimes as well transcending reality to gain power from a different person from ascended master all these things are influences outside of sober-minded reality 
But the only opposite of it is sobriety. That is the only opposite. That's the only antonym to all those words is sobriety. So the main idea of this text right here, this is, this is why Paul said this in chapter 2. The main idea is that biblical sound doctrine is the only sufficient influence to sober up and to grow a person in their faith, in their character, in their, their wifehood, in their, their fatherhood, in their husbandry. All these things are talking about how sound doctrine will cause a man to be sober-minded and have a pattern of good works, a pattern, a lifestyle that reflects. If you turn back and you look at the footsteps, they walk like Christ walked. They walk like Jesus Christ walked, who is God in the flesh. That was Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh. And so sound doctrine causes the servants to walk and work in a, in a true fidelity. And they, the, the sound doctrine ultimately just teaches them to deny the ungodliness and the worldly lusts. If you want us to be honest, the way that people end up drunk high in these influences and whatnot is not only just, you know, a desire to escape reality, it's by an influence that can, that, you know, may have presented this as something that's worthwhile. But in the end, it was ungodliness and led us to, you know, what we're experiencing right now, okay? So, biblical sound doctrine is the only sufficient influence to sober up the affected mind for this world. We must ascertain what is true in a world of falsehood. Everybody loves the idea of being outside of the matrix, but the problem is, while they rely on themselves, on substances, on parties, on all these things, on all these influences, to help them to deal with this world and cope, you are literally still using the influence of the Matrix. What was the thing that they said in the Matrix? He's beginning to believe. What is he beginning to believe in? Himself. You're right back in the Matrix. Because the whole world, Buddhists, Islamists, Holy Spirit-filled Christians more focused on themselves than Jesus. The real object of their faith is themselves. My friend, I am not trying to point you to yourself. The real object of your faith. This is sound doctrine right here. The only thing that's going to get you truly, truly to a spiritual state where you're not only sober, but you're able to cope with this reality without faking it and escaping back to another escapism is your Savior Jesus Christ. He is the object of your faith. He is the point of your pursuit. You want to look in your Bible and find out how to be more like him, how to learn what he taught, how to be what he expected human beings to be. That is the whole point. That's the sound doctrine. So we, when we want falsehood to be moved away and to find the truth, look at what Jesus Christ says about it in his context. And so how do you define that terminology right here in the gold? How do you define sound doctrine? How do you define that? Well, sound is of good health, free from defect, disease and it's in good condition competent sensible valid having no defect as to truth justice wisdom or reason and so all those things have to do with how your mind really works right and so doctrine is a particular principle a position or a policy taught or advocated as of a religion or of a government something that is taught or teachings as a collective unit okay so doctrine is essentially teachings sound teachings understanding okay what is the sky it's something blue but it's also very much what holds the stars and what actually holds the stars in place according to the Bible is not only the sky, but it's God who created the sky, right? God created the stars, he created the people, he created you, he created myself. That's doctrine, it's a Bible teaching, it's sound, okay? It comes into play when you realize that people who you walk by in Walmart are not some ape that just evolved into a human, but they are whom God intentionally, with purpose and desire, created. He desired to work to, to make them he, he did it for his own glory and so that's what that's that's what sound doctrine is it's, it's, it's teaching that's real tangible evident it's free from disease or defect and it's got reason and wisdom tied, tied to it truth okay so what is sober-minded then let's understand more definitions as we go into this what is sober-minded there's many similar definitions you see you see circumspect to restore one to his senses free from excess recklessness extravagance or exaggeration you know if i'm sober-minded and i really don't want you to vote for kamala harris i'm not going to paint her as a demon with horns upside down hanging from the bottom of a lake as if she's going to creep into your into your beach towel and just attack you no i'm not going to do that because that's stupid i'm going to paint it as okay this person who is you know partially this race and partially that race has policies that we don't necessarily agree with so in a sober-minded sense I'm going to explain what it is that she does wrong and why it would be that I would vote for somebody else instead of her. Instead of using emotions, instead of exaggerating, I'm going to tell you exactly what's wrong and why I'm going to do the right thing. That's what sober 
addressing of the issue would be, right? That's where we're at right now, 2024. It's going to be later on when I see this again. But that is a lack of exaggeration in sober-mindedness, sane or rational. People can be irrational when they make the right decisions and then therefore have made the wrong decision about how they're going to be rational, okay? Showing self-control marked by seriousness, gravity, solemnity as of demeanor of speech or, you know, regular calm, not under the influence of passion, capable of reason. More recent definitions contain being abstinent from intoxication and alcoholic effects. Context, in the context of this passage, being free from influences that distort biblical reasoning. Don't forget, Titus was being told to speak to other things which become sound doctrine, which Bible doctrine comes out of the Bible. And so if I have extra biblical influences, like my love for marijuana is going to make me say, oh, what verse actually talks about smoking weed? That's not, that's not sound doctrine, nor is it being sober-minded. And in the context, that's not, none of that is sobriety. I'm taking a truth to the Word of God instead of getting the truth out of the Word of God, okay? I'm going to end up a hypocrite who advocates for everything that I do wrong if I don't ever actually look at the context. That's what we're doing in this generation. It's very bad. It's, it's making God say things he never said. It's not sober-minded at all, okay? A sober worldview is a biblical worldview. Sober decision-making is biblical decision-making. To be sober is to be free from mentally impairing, blinding, or deceiving influences that won't tell things how they are. My friend, I think we did it in the last video, but just so that you guys can see this, not my, not, not the, the, the page full of videos about being sober, but so that you can see this, that marijuana has some terribly negative effects, and we're going to put this in the comments, and we're going to put it in, I should say, the description, but there are some negative effects to marijuana. Yes, you can. There are no reported cases of adolescents overdosing and killing themselves in it, obviously. That's why people think that it's okay, but it's not. I'm going to tell you how it is. Marijuana causes problems. It causes testicular cancer. It causes issues with your lungs. It causes issues with pregnancies. It causes issues with kids and their developments. It's real. That's, there are real symptoms to marijuana that will damage the human being that does it and, all, and those around them. I'm going to tell you how it is. That's, that's, that's what sobriety is. It's reality. It's exactly things that impair your reality are not sober. And so, so to, be a, to have a sober worldview is to be free from mental and spiritual drunkenness or excess rashness or confusion. We therefore are referring to the exact same basic end goal. Here's the end goal. To truly cope with and see reality as it is. This is exactly what God freely offers to us in the word of God. It's free. You don't, have to, you don't have to go and watch The Matrix 30 times and try to figure out what, what Neo was saying and what Morpheus was saying for you to have sober-mindedness. You just need to read your Bible. You just need to study it in its context. You just need to genuinely want, sincerely want to understand what God was trying to tell you at that point in time and now. You just sincerely need to add to your life a desire above everything else to know what God is saying in his word and how to live that out. And you will be victorious, not only over the concept of just being drunk or high or, you know, delusional or musically manipulated, but you're going to be victorious over so many habits. And so, my friend, this is not simply just like a, hey, come be, come not be high anymore. Come not be drunk. No, that's not this. The focus is Jesus Christ and how he can bless your life if you just sincerely desire a relationship with him. That's the fallout. That's the dripping off of the relationship. That's the excess. That's the cup running over. But the relationship with God itself, the relationship with God itself, where you can see the actual sincere smile on my face, where at one point, if you saw me making videos and talking and singing and doing whatever, there was not that joy. I'm going to promise you something right now. You will not subjectively find the peace of God in whatever it is you want to pursue. You will only find the sincere, identical, matchable peace of God that you see from me right now and my friends whom we've shared the testimonies of, you will only find the peace of God through the word of God, through the salvation that God freely offers through the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, you will not. This is, not, this is, this is the problem with people. This is the definition right here. When I would say the definition of the peace of God comes from the word of God, you say, oh, so, so what you're saying is if I just find my truth and run with it, I'll get to that point of mind. No. That's not sober-mindedness. That's not even honestly taking things as they are. That's not seeing things as it is. My friend, I got this peace because I sincerely repented of the sins that I could tell you the name and the word of and when I did them and what time I did them and how they were real. 
and the, and the intention of my heart being evil. And I went to God and I sincerely, with desire to be forgiven, addressed my sin before God. There was nothing else tied to it. There was no works that I did. There's no ritual that I did. There's no secret achievement where I finally self-actualized. None of that happened. So we need to think practically and realistically instead of inconclusive and mystically. Okay? That's what sober-minded is. Thinking practically and realistically instead of soberly and mystically or instead of inconclusive and mystically because you're not thinking about what the conclusion is of what I... Where's the conclusion? When do I finally find that peace? Where does it happen? Well, it happens when you're sincere with God. When you look in your room, you look at your phone's history, when you look at your interactions, your relationships with people and saying, is this sin, God? Am I, am I sinful? Have I separated myself from you? When you sincerely do exactly that and you sincerely want God to forgive you, my friend, that is why we have this verse right here in Titus chapter 2, where it says Jesus Christ gave himself for us. He shed his blood on the cross for our sins. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works, ready to do the good things the Bible tells us to do. And so, if we talk about those good works, we have to talk about practicality, right? Because you have to put good works into practice, as you saw in, I believe, verse 7 or 6 of this chapter keep this look at this look at this it says a pattern of good works showing myself a pattern of good works how am i going to have a pattern well i have to put things into practice and so there has to be some practicality i have to there's this this discussion comes up often but pornographic addiction and all those things is also part of lacking sober-mindedness and so if you're going to put into practice something that really gives you the victory your relationship with god has to be first intentionally in the center of the room this is the object of which we're pursuing, a sincere, intentional relationship with God where we understand what his word of God says and how to apply it. So practically, aka putting something into practice, is not the enemy of faith. In fact, we must put our faith in the Lord to do the or for him to do the impossible while we faithfully confront the possible. That's putting things into practice. I cannot remove myself the spiritual separation between me and god but i can trust that jesus christ did it when he shed his blood for my sins and you know what i can do i can kneel down i can think on heaven i can open my mouth and with sincerity of my heart i can call upon god that's practical that's real it's not mystical it's practical okay i can also put down the influences i can i can take this if it might have whatever substance i shouldn't have inside of it i can take this and i can pour it out and then i can never drink it again i can throw the drink in the crap in, in the trash those are practical solutions. And then when I pass by it at Walmart, I look the opposite way. It's, these are practices that you can put into practice that can help you to go from the opposite of sobriety, whatever it may be, to being sober-minded. If you want the victory, you will have to be and live a victorious life and choose and decide intentionally to not just look away from sin, not just look away from the bad influences, but look intentionally on the blessed God of our Savior Jesus Christ, Him Himself. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for Jesus Christ. We're looking to be like Jesus Christ. We're looking to live His influence out. And so, I hope this video was a blessing to you guys. Make sure that you do give this a like and a thumbs up. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to compel you to make a sincere, intentional decision that this point forward, whatever it is, this point forward, henceforth, therefore, at this moment in time, I'm going to make an intentional decision to sober up by sound Bible doctrine that the Word of God provides. And you will be victorious when you bring that prayer to God. I believe it intentionally. I believe it. So do that, my friend. Do it. I'm praying for you. I hope this reaches who it needs to. I'm praying for you. So give us the like. Help us grow chickens.